Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. All right, I'm excited. This is our first guest episode. Um, I don't know about you, Azai, but I'm I'm pretty excited to to add another person. Since I'm worried that we're gonna like talk forever because we're adding like a third person. Very stoked, especially given who our very first special guest is. Very special indeed. Needs no introduction. Yeah, we of have- course. On the Jack Weston <laughs> MCAT podcast, we should probably have Jack Weston on at some point. So. <laughs> Uh, Jack, want to welcome you to the uh, to the podcast. How's it going? Good, Phil. Azai, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. I know how hard you guys are working on helping the next generation of physicians. I mean, it's an, it's remarkable what we've been able able to do together, and um, I'm just really glad to be a part of this journey. That's that's so funny talking about the next generation because I already feel like I'm kind of like I've already been in med school and so I'm like, I'm like the grandpa and then like as <laughs> I you're like in the throes of it now we have like the younger generation going through here, um, but we're, we're talking about cars today and so you know we've been talking about the chem phys the bio the psych social sections and like we we have to talk about cars because cars is such an interesting section of the test. I think like if I ever talk to a student and a student's like, oh, I'm doing really well in three sections of the test, but I'm bombing one of them. I always know which one it is. Like it's, it's always cars. There's something about cars that makes that like it, that doesn't translate to the other sections. And so like being good at bio and biochem means that a lot of those skills are going to transfer over to chem phys. Cause if you're good at data interpretation, you're good at data interpretation. But all of a sudden, when you get to the realm of cars, that, that doesn't always hold true. I actually think some of the things that make a student good in the science sections actually make them worse in the cars section. And like learning how to balance this and learning how to tackle that that other weird portion of the test is is something that that's that's been a challenge to students forever. Um, which is why you know Jack, you've had so much success working with with cars students trying to Im- improve their scores in that one specific section. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when I was starting off as a pre-med, I realized that the verbal section, I mean, it was called verbal back when I was studying for it, was uh, going to be daunting, it was going to be a challenging section. So I started off, uh, start just reading articles on The Economist and just try to get used to reading more because as a pre-med, I wasn't really interested in reading. I don't, I don't, I can't speak for every pre-med, but I, you know, I was more into sciences, chemistry, physics, anatomy, not so much reading. Right. And so just getting that start helped me understand what the role of cars really is. And like you said, it's very different than the sciences and the sciences. It's sort of like plug and chug. You learn the science, you learn the equations, and then you spit it out on an exam. When it comes to cars, it's more about a conversation. It's more about listening, paying attention. So it kind of mimics more of a physician's role in how they go about helping their patients. And I think that's where the value of cars comes in. It's a humanities approach to learning. And that's not something most students are accustomed to, especially pre-meds. So uh, that's where my start kind of, you know, where I started off with it. And, um, and over time, it's, it's been really fun trying to show students what cars is truly about, you know, we can definitely talk about that. Yeah. So I have to hop in um, because for those of you who were here early on in the podcast, I was actually a Spanish language and literature major in undergrad. So I went the humanities route fairly early on um, and that all that to say, none of us is immune from the stress of cars, not a single one of us. And so when I was first studying for the MCAT, um, when I, in, a little back up a little bit in undergrad, right? So I took the, I took literature as, as my major um, because I wanted the opportunity to do something other than the sciences, knowing that I would do the sciences for the rest of my life. Uh, and so when I went to, you know, start studying for the MCAT for the car section, I reverted right back into my pre, you know, um, humanities major ways, so to speak, and went right back into science mode because my head was, this is the MCAT. This is to get you into medical school. It is science oriented. You know what you need to do. It was not what I needed to do. And we'll definitely talk all about that. Um, but I think that 
having spent some time, you know, studying for the MCAT, taking the MCAT now away and in medical school and seeing patients, it is so, so true. You can, if you can see these passages as your future patients, as conversations with future patients, it, it can be, it can, it can honestly make a huge difference. Um, and every so often I'll have a conversation with a patient and I'll find my mind wandering. And I do the same thing I do when I go to car or when I'm reading a car's passage, bring it back. Right. <laughs> and so a lot of the things that you do in normal conversation and conversations with people that you care about, such as future patients, you'll do it in cars. And so it's the one section that we have to retrain ourselves to do something we already know how to do, which I think makes it a very special section. Yeah. It's, it's completely like, I always, I always feel like when I walk into the science sections, I have tools. I have like a bandolier filled with equations. I have a bazooka (laughs) of knowledge of kidneys and electrostatics. And I'm like, I got all these tools and things that I can, I can bring to bear. And then you walk into cars and you're naked and like, I got nothing, right? This is a passage about the Russian oligarchy. And I know nothing about the (laughs) Russian oligarchy. Here's a passage about this Indonesian dung beetle. And I'm like, I got nothing for that. Um, and I know that that can be really daunting. And I know a lot of students really question like, why, why is cars important? And I know that's something that both of you kind of like indicated with, you know, like it's, it's so like, why, like where, what role does this play? And you both said it, you know, it has to do with like interacting with patients. And I think students underestimate how important it is to understand how, not just like the medicine, but understand how your patients are feeling. Um, and that is really important medically. Obviously, as a doctor, you need to learn a lot of things. But this is always the example I, I like to talk about. Like, if you talk to a, like, let's say you have a 17-year-old that you diagnose with an osteosarcoma, and like you're talking to them, and you're like, listen, uh, it is cancer. I know we were kind of hoping it wasn't, but we caught it early, and we need, we're going to want to do surgery, and we're going to want to do chemo. But because we caught it early, it's probably go, like the, the outlook is, is, is good. Like it doesn't seem like it's um, like, this isn't a, a, a necessarily life ending thing. Now, if the patient responds, it's like 17 year old who's, you know, in their 17 year old world, you know, they, they respond and say, well, like, I'm not going to be able to pay, play basketball and I'm on chemo. Right. I mean, coach Watkins and the guys were really hoping to go to state this year. They're going to be, they're going to be really upset. We were really hoping to do well, but I mean, if, I mean, overall, like the, if, if that's the scenario, I guess that's okay. And I, I, I don't mean to sound callous. Um, there are some things there that I don't really care about. The kid's name, coach's name is coach Watkins. That that's not really important for me. I don't necessarily need to catch that. And like, that's not going to affect the medicine, but he said, coach Watkins and the guys are going to be upset. And that's really important because so often like the, the outcomes of medical scenarios depend on how people are feeling. There's a lot of students out there or a lot of patients, pardon, um, a lot of patients out there who get diagnosed with cancer and they feel like a burden to everyone else. And so they don't want to ask for help and they feel like they're making everyone else's life worse. And so there are people out there who need a ride to chemo, but don't want to ask anyone for a ride to chemo. And so they don't get a ride. So they don't get chemo and then they die. People die because they feel guilty, because they feel like a burden. And so your job as a physician is not just to know like all the drug interactions, all the treatments and all the like the diagnostic tools. Your job is also to make sure you understand how that patient is feeling. And I think that that's something that gets very lost in in the realm of like prepping for medical school. And I think that that's actually one of the great things about the MCAT, because that's what the CARS section is doing. That's the one section that's not trying to test what you know. It's trying to test, do you understand what these people think, how these people feel? Like, do you understand that? And that's, that's like a really critical part of medicine that people just kind of like brush away. I know I did when I first started. I was all about like, I want like equations and like drug interactions and like what's the enzyme specificity for like substrate. Like I I was a science guy. And so it was hard for me to understand what I saw as like the fluffy, useless portion of like feelings and things like that. But it turns out like, actually, no, that's really critical in medicine. And a a lot of people underappreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, Phil's point about communication is, I think really important here because a lot of times we forget that cars is this human interaction that we're having with someone we don't even know, right? It's an author we've, we just read, we're reading from for the first time, 
And we sometimes project our anxieties about how it's an exam, how it's an institution, quote unquote, trying to get us onto this. And that's where I think the problem comes from. It's just, we don't end up connecting with that person. Um, and then to Azai's point, uh, it's something we're already really good at. Like, you know, it, we're training ourselves to go back to what we already know. And I think that's so important because if you think about your interactions with random people, whether it's maybe someone you meet at the, on the elevator, right. Or someone that you're talking to at Starbucks, for instance, you're going to listen to them, right? Because they're in front of you. And so I think cars is just like that. It's except it's written by someone maybe 20, 30 years ago on a topic that you just don't know anything about, right? And they're forcing you to listen for the sake of, you know, being able to communicate with them. So, yeah, I feel, like, um, I feel like that's done kind of on purpose because if the MCAT asks you about stuff like that's really easy to understand. Everyone would get all the questions. And so that's really the challenge with cars is they have to turn up the difficulty where it's really difficult readings because they need to separate people because um, that's the whole point of the exam. And so like the passages need to be a little bit tricky. Like they need to, like the people whose opinions are given in the passage, those opinions aren't always given like in this very clear, like I am happy about this, right? Like that's not like you have to kind of like find those keywords and find, you know, like dig through this. Because like ultimately, like they do need to be able to separate people. And so like conceptually cars feels like it should be the easiest. I, you know, you walk into cars, like you said, and like you're naked, but you don't need anything, right? Like you, you're given this passage and every answer is in the passage. And so like, that sounds like the easiest test ever. It's open note and they hand you the notes, but they, they have to turn up the difficulty because in order to actually like separate people. And so while it is like a very fundamental thing, I think it's kind of like turned up to a difficulty that a lot of students and a lot of people aren't paying attention to um, in, in undergrad. And so, or, or just like in life in general, not necessarily in undergrad. And so I think that's also kind of an interesting thing Well, where it is kind of like a lot of what you're doing in your daily life, but just kind of like ev everybody's a little bit like hiding their intentions. Like it's not quite as blatant as you know if you have a significant other and they're like hey i'm mad you ate all the bananas like why did you not like save me one you know i was planning on eating a smoothie this morning like that's it's not going to be super clear like that yeah so something that as you were talking kind of came to mind is because all of you guys that are listening to us want to be doctors so you know we're going to keep bringing it back mm -hmm. it's conversations with patients of different ages right you have a toddler who's trying to tell you what's wrong they don't have you know the vocabulary to tell you that it's this particular aspect of their knee right it's the this the medial portion not the lateral like the center not the the side right whereas if you have a conversation with an adult you know they can probably give you a bit more information as people start getting older and have you know um other cognitive difficulties their ability to directly tell you what they what you need to know declines and so you're trying to see what they have to say but also you're getting the gist right so you're not like phil said you're not nitpicking every, every single uh detail that they mention you're trying to really get to know them and understand what they want you to know at the most fundamental level and i think this goes to something that we've all been um hinting at if we haven't outright said it right is that and like phil said you don't have to have anything else to come into this portion of the exam but it's something that you can prep for it's something that it's you don't have to bring anything in. So with a good set of strategies, with the right set of strategies, you can do really well. And at the end of the day, that's what we're here to help you do, right? Do your best on this exam, on this important exam. And with this section that causes so much anxiety for students um, that, like Jack said, they bring into the, the conversation with the patient, the conversation um, you know, with the author. Uh, it's important to just kind of remember that you can keep that anxiety separate. And then with a solid set of, of strategies, just with things that you're used to doing, even if it is at a slightly more difficult level on, on the actual exam, do really well on this section. Yeah. As you're talking about like why people don't like this section, right? We, we always come back to the lack of familiarity with the topic. And I see this from students all the time. And I, I'm sure you guys do too. What if I don't know the words? What if I don't know anything about the topic? right? Like, what can I do? Should I be studying history and the civil war and the revolution? And should I be studying about architecture and philosophy? Uh, no, you don't have to, right? Of course, you should know the basic 
underlying principles or ideologies of, of these fields. Like what does philosophy study? What does architecture look at? Sure, you need to know that. But outside of that, it, you just need to be able to be objective in the, in the moment. And sometimes when we read, it's very hard to be objective. It's really hard to pay attention to someone else and not bring in a biased point of view, right? And I think that's what's hard. And that's what you need to train yourself to do is try to read in a way that allows you to fully understand what the author is saying and not what you want the author to say, right? We inject our own opinions, our own ideas onto the author to fill in the gaps when we're not paying attention. And I think that's why we need to read often. That's why we need to practice cars and, and try to get used to its style, like you said, as I. Yeah, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, so like talking about like bringing in outside opinion, I, this is something a lot of students say like, oh, I feel like I didn't know anything about like Portugal's view of the French Revolution, like how Portugal felt about it. Or I didn't know like how Olav Hammer felt about anthroposophy. So how am I supposed to do these passages? Very often I will see students like struggle, not with those passages. Students will struggle with the passages about viral videos or about Beyonce's music video, or a passage about like memes and like modern memetics. And it's like this whole passage, which is really just about memes. And, and students, like they read this, and, like, I know this, like this is something I can do. And then they fall into the trap and they start bringing in their own knowledge. I think it's really important to remember that the cars section is the only section of the test where you, you will be punished for bringing in a lot of outside viewpoints. And, and that's what I was saying before, like being good at the sciences, like in the sciences, you have to bring in knowledge, like what's insulin, right? Like, what does it mean if the, the current goes up in a circuit? Like, what does that mean probably happened to the resistance? Well, it probably dropped. And you have to bring in all of this, this stuff. But when you walk into cars, you kind of have to take everything you know and just chuck it out the window. So if you see a passage on like religion or evolution or medicine or healthcare or like disease, the MCAT writers know that you know about that. And they want to see not what you know, they want to see, can you understand these people, like the, these other points of views? And so I think that that's something that can be really hard because in the sciences, you get rewarded for bringing your own stuff in, your baggage, your tools. Um, but in the car section, if you try to approach it the same way, it just punishes you. And, and so like, it, it's a struggle because it's like, is good here, but bad here. And so you have to, I always like to like take everything. I feel like the, like, I feel like the MCAT is a lot like the biathlon in the Olympics because there's Olympics going on. Um, but in the biathlon and Olympics, it's, it's, it's a winter thing. It's like skiing and shooting guns. And like, what do those have to do with each other? Like nothing. I feel like the sciences are kind of the same where it's like, or the MCAT is kind of the same where you have the sciences, which are all really similar. And then you have something else that's like completely different and it's a completely different skill set. And so like there's so much, there's such a big line between the other three sections and cars. And you have to not just like, it's, it's not just different topics, but you have to change the way that you're thinking. You have to change the way that you're approaching. And I know that that's something that I personally struggled with a lot um, as I started because I was a very sciencey kind of guy. And like, I, I, I struggled with cars when I very first began. Yeah. So uh, something else that, and, and I completely agree with you, right? Like that's something that we get penalized for in cars if, if we're not very careful. Something else that I think that we try and transfer from the sciences that ends up hurting us with cars um, is the way that we study for it. So for the sciences, for those of you that are listening, raise your hand if you've crammed for an exam, right? I'm going to give you a second. Everyone's hand should be up <laughs> yeah. because in undergrad, basically everyone at one point or another crams for an exam. You can't do that for cars. And before anyone thinks that I'm judging them, I had a conversation with a friend earlier today. We have a midterm on Friday. We were talking about what our study plans will look like. <laughs> we pushed a little too, a little too close for comfort. Um, so we all do it. But with cars, you it's not, it's not a good strategy because what ends up happening is you'll sit down and you'll try and do a block of practice passages, right? Let's say an, let's throw an arbitrary number out there, nine. Hmm. See who's paying attention. Um, so you try and sit down and you sit down and try and do nine passages in one sitting, right? What's going to happen if you don't have the proper strategies and you don't have the endurance built up and you don't have all of these other tools that you need that we've talked about um, that you already know how to do, right? You already know these things. You're just learning to refine them for cars. What's going to happen is you're going to get distracted. You're going to start rereading. You're going to start missing questions that you otherwise would have gotten correct. You're going to get discouraged 
right? Now that discouragement or that uh, being discouraged is going to make it more difficult in future sessions because now you're extra nervous, right? So then it becomes this cycle that, you know, Phil and I, we talked about stress, right? At the very beginning of, of this podcast series. Um, whereas with the sciences that can work out because sometimes it's like, you know, you're, you're studying and then it's bam, brain dump, go on with your life. Cars is not a brain dump. You cannot, you cannot cram cars into the last three weeks of studying for the MCAT. You cannot cram cars into one day and never having done, you know, spaced out practice passages before. So this is the section where um, doing practice passages in a very slow, meticulous way, almost to the point where it feels ridiculous, can actually be super, super helpful. Whereas in the sciences, you know, that's it's helpful and it's important students can sometimes get away with that a little bit more. Now, if you were paying attention to our, our earlier podcast, you know that you shouldn't be doing that for the sciences anyway, right? Um, but if we're all honest, it's something that we've just leaned into more in undergrad that we have to kind of try and shake when we're studying for the MCAT, most importantly in the car section. That's such a good point um, about just not cramming. And I, I kind of visit this in the trial sessions with students when we talk about maturity, right? Having the maturity to accept your responsibility, right? To accept your weaknesses and um, and just allowing yourself to make mis- mistakes and allowing yourself to grow. And if you don't study for this, you know, within a reasonable amount of time, you're never going to grow. You're never going to have those moments of clarity and improve your score. Um, you know, students always ask, okay, what do I need to do well? I think it's two things. It's focus, being able to focus on the author and the discipline, being able to follow the, the right strategies to get to the right answers. Um, but you can't have focus and discipline if you don't have maturity, right? If you don't have the sense to sit down and actually study and understand your mistakes and be meticulous, like you said, when you review these passages. So, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. And then to Phil's point about like how the, how like the sciences are so different from cars. uh, That's so true. You know, like if you think about even the psych social section, which sort of mimics our understanding of behaviors, right. And what's, what's, what's ethical, what's not ethical. I think that's kind of why they're adding that new section Oh, I shouldn't say new. I mean, it's been around. I do the same five. thing. I'm like, oh, that new section they added six years ago. Six uh, years ago, right? But I mean, they added the psych so section, and I, you know, they came up with this idea that oh yeah, our physicians should be very caring and compassionate. So let's test them and make sure they know all these concepts, right? Uh, that's great. But what about the application of those concepts? And that's where cars comes in. Cars allows you to be compassionate. Cars allows you to listen and pay attention and understand what's going on. So I think that's why the Canadian schools, if you're Canadian, Hey, uh, you know, I think that's why the Canadian schools really love cars. It's because it allows them to see whether or not you can actually connect with the person on the other end, right? Whether it's a patient or some random author that you know nothing about. Yeah. There's, I, I feel like there's a lot, like, I feel like we've kind of like touched on the idea that this is something that you need to like practice a lot. And I know that's what Azai, you know, kind of focused on there, but I just, I just want to reiterate how crucial that is. Like if I'm ever meeting with a, a, a student for tutoring day one, what do we talk about? Cars, because cars is the one thing that you need to like for, it's not knowledge, right? We're talking about cramming, you can cram knowledge. You could sit down in, a, in the morning and know nothing about magnetism. And at the end of the day, you understand magnetism. That's something that you can do. But cars is a skill. It's not knowledge. Like you don't need to know any details. It's more of the process and application. Um, you know, that, that dedication that, that Jack, you know, was talking about and like, you know, sticking with it and, you know, kind of like keeping up that pressure. And, and that's because it's a skill. Like you can't sit down with a book, like how to master golf, read the book and set the book down. Like you're not Tiger Woods at the end of that. Like in order to get good at golf, you have to have a golf club in your hand and you have to practice every day and often. And like, you have to like keep going for a while. And I think that's one of the reasons that students struggle with cars is because the fact that it's a skill makes it hard for you to see your growth in like over the course of a couple hours, right? I can see my growth, but like I studied kidneys. I know kidneys better now than I did 
earlier. If I spent two hours doing these passages about like the Russian oligarchy and the dung beetle, right? Like that's, that knowledge is never going to help me again on any other passages. And so a lot of students tend to push back on cars and, and like push it till later in their prep. They want to like, because they feel the reward to like from, from like studying and like, I know more now than I knew this morning, but cars, cars is a skill. And the only way to get better at a skill is to practice daily. If, if you go to like basketball practice in the morning at the end of the day, you don't feel like a better basketball player. But if you go to basketball practice in the morning, every morning for a month, at the end of the month, you are a better basketball player. And that's really the only way you can improve. Um, you can't do it by like necessarily just like studying and reading a book, going and practicing for just one hour. Like it's this constant pressure. And that's the only thing that, that cars gives to. And so you have to start on it. This probably should be one of the very first things that you start studying um, and, and working on that. And I, I really advocate students like do cars daily and don't do cars at the end of the day, do it first. Because what happens is students will spend all day studying and they're like tired and they're like, oh, I'll do cars tomorrow, like extra. And like what happens is students just don't. And so just make sure that when you are studying, I think honestly, every day, the first thing that you're doing to prep for the MCAT should be a cars passage. And that that's the only way to make sure that you are making yourself do it every day. And like, you're not like spreading that out and pushing it off till later, because that's, even though it feels like it feels so good to study like content at the end of the day, like you can push that off to, to later. Not that you should, I'm not telling everyone to like push off content, but you can, you can't push off cars. Like cars is the one, because it's a skill, you have to be working on it from day one all the way up until the day of your test. Two quick thoughts. First, no one has an excuse to not do a daily cars. We have the Jack Weston daily mm -hmm. cars passages that come out. So you have more than ample resources to get that consistent practice in. Um, the second thing that, uh, that I just wanted to touch on is, Phil, you mentioned that constant pressure, right? With that constant pressure comes asking yourself and diagnosing, right? <laughs> um, why you're missing questions where, you know, like Jack was saying, where is my weakness? What do I need to work on? What am I still having difficulty with? Am I still having difficulty with the reading per se, right? Reading comprehension. Am I having difficulty with the questions? If with the questions, right? Is it a specific question type? Is it that I'm bringing in outside information? Um, so while, you know, you, it's the one section where it feels like I don't see any growth. I'm, I sat down, I did all of this work and I'm not seeing the results. You can also just use it as an opportunity to, before you're a doctor, start getting some practice diagnosing things, diagnose your own, your own difficulties um, and weaknesses so that you can work on them so that they no long, so that they're no longer weaknesses. And that's something that, you know, in the courses is mentioned quite a bit. Um, just making sure that you understand each, the, the, what you're reading, right? The process of, of answering questions. Um, but it's, it's something that requires, like Phil said, constant pressure, both from the practice and from the, um, the honest, self-honesty and self, um, just awareness. Yeah, self-awareness and honesty is always big because like a lot of times students will kind of lie to themselves <laughs> with that, yeah. you know, hindsight bias, like, oh, I knew that, like, I'm, I'm fine, um. You know, I, I had a student the other day call it metacognitive analysis. Like they, they're like, I got better at, at analyzing myself. I can actually see where I'm going wrong and why. And I, I see it, you know, you see it in workshops, you see it in office hours. Uh, they'll start pinpointing their own problems. Uh, that's the hardest thing, right? When you have problems and you don't know what they are, it's easy to just brush it off and say, oh, I'll just study this later, right? And like you said, Phil, like studying early on every day, um, even though it's kind of a pain to do it as the first thing, you, you feel better. You feel more relieved when it's out of the way, even though you might not score very high. Right. And the key is to not let your emotions get the best of you and to just allow yourself to make those mistakes. And again, to analyze them. Um, I think there are really two types of car uh, of students, right? They're, they're the type that are more knowledge-based. They want to study, 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 know all the sciences or know all the concepts of, of something and then apply that to the questions. And I think those are like the 4.0, the 3.9 GPA students who really struggle with cars. The other 
type of student, in my opinion, is the critical thinking type of student. And that kind of student does well, even if they don't know a lot of the sciences, because they can read the passage, extract the right information and apply it to the passage, to the questions. It's hard to become more of the critical thinking type of student if you're so used to being this rote memorization, just understand this now kind of student. And that's what we try to do, right? Like we're trying to help students understand how, what, what to pick out and how to pick it out. And when it comes to critical thinking, I think there are two components. There's the reading aspect, comprehension of the passage. First time you read it, not after like two or three times, right? And being confident with what you understand. And then of course, the application of that comprehension. So figure out where you're going off, right? Is it the reading? Do you, are you understanding what you're supposed to from this passage? And then are you able to answer the questions without, you know, any kind of bias? Are you able to apply it? So, you know, that's what we kind of help with, but that's what I think any student should be able to do by the time they take the test is read the passage, understand it for what it's saying, and then uh, ultimately understand why the wrong answers are wrong and how they ended up with the right answer. Yeah, I, I feel I feel personally attacked and called out there, Jack. I feel like you are describing what I was as a student when I first started. I was definitely that one student who like was very good at like memorizing stuff, right? I was a biology and chemistry and physics triple major. I just wanted to know all the sciences. Um, and but like like I just wanted to like learn that stuff. I didn't necessarily want to like read and like, how does Steve feel? I don't care. Who cares how Steve feels? I want to know like if Steve falls out the window, how long will it take for him to hit the ground? I want an <laughs> equation, right? Um, I, I'm sorry, Steve. Um, so I think th this is one of the things. So when I first started prepping for the MCAT, I'm actually going to like shine a window on myself because I was that student that struggled. And I was that student who like not, not the Azai, like super literature, um, you know, background where I like, I didn't, didn't know and like think about kind of like the literature side. I just wanted like universal truths. Um, so when I, when I first started prepping, I actually took a course with, with Kaplan and they, they like, they didn't really go into like the diagnosing side of things. And that is so crucial because I was doing this passage a day. And I should, I should clarify, you know, I do want students to do a passage day, but you have to review it very thoroughly. That's where you grow. And I was just doing this passage day because that's what I was told to do. But I wasn't like, I wasn't really improving because I wasn't really, I would look at a question like, oh, okay, B is the right answer. That makes sense given the passage. And then I, I'd never stopped and ask, why am I missing these questions? What's, what's my issue? And, and this happened for months. And so my car score, all my other scores kept going up because I would study physics, better at physics, study bio, better at bio. Cars wouldn't, wouldn't move. Until one day I went and I looked over two exams, like two practice exams that I'd taken. And I looked at just the cars and I, I, instead of trying to figure out like what was the right answer, why was it right? I tried to just categorize what kind of question or why am I missing the questions? And like this question, why did I miss it? This question, why did I miss it? And what I found was that really it's like 70% of the questions I missed was because I was bringing out of scope information, um, especially on these certain types of questions. And once I realized that I'm like, oh, like all these questions in the past, I didn't realize my issue was I was just bringing outside information. And so after that, whenever I took a test, I would like be torn between two answer choice. I'm like, which one of these is right? I'm like, all right, Phil, you always pick out of scope. One of these is probably out of scope. And I'd look at it, I'm like, yeah, B is out of scope. The answer is D. And then I'd move on. Or anytime I saw that question, I'm like, oh, this is that sort of question that you always choose out of scope. Before you even look at the answer choices, Phil, do not pick an out of scope answer. Like, I don't care if you get it wrong, but do not choose an out of scope. And so over the course of that, like I, I like over two months, nothing happened with cars. I reviewed that exam, those two exams. And then I took another test over the course of that, like two, three days, my car score went up five points. And then kept going up after that because I figured out what my issue was. And there are students who have issues for different, like for different things. Like you might be running out of time. You might not understand the passage it might be a certain type of question or a certain type of wrong answer, like what I did. Um, and I think it's really important for students to understand that it's, if you are just doing practice every day and you're not trying to figure out how can I improve on this? That's a problem. That's like, if you're trying to get good at baking, 
and you bake a cake every day and it never looks good. And you never ask yourself, what did I do wrong? Like you just keep making the bad recipe where you like add in salt instead of sugar. And if you do that every day, that doesn't make you a better baker. That just makes you stubborn. And that's, that's what I was. I was just stubborn and I wasn't really improving because I wasn't trying to figure out what was I doing wrong. Yeah, I think what you have said is so incredibly important. Um, and thank you for sharing, you know, your your journey, your trajectory with all of us. Um, I think that it's an experience that a lot of people have on some level, right? You know, you you don't realize what you're doing wrong. And then when you do, that's when you start seeing progress that you hadn't been seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so making sure that, you know, you go through each of the daily passages that you do, like we said, almost painstakingly for a lot of us, you know, we're used to trying to get through things very quickly. Take some time, sit down with that passage that you just completed, right? Was it something about, you know, like Phil said, was it that you were pulling in outside information and had a lot of out of scope answers? Um, Was it something on the reading comprehension side? So uh, something that I think that will be helpful for students who struggle with out of scope is something that this is not specific to to the MCAT, but it was something I I learned from an author we had a conversation with in undergrad. And I remember asking him, and I've never forgotten this conversation. I asked him, and I couldn't tell you what the specific details were, but I asked him why a character did something. And he looked at me and he just said, because she wanted to. And I was like, that is so unsatisfying. (laughs) You know, like, what do you mean? Because she wanted to, because that's what she wanted to, right? So what happens in front of you in that passage is because that's what the author wants right? That's it. If you keep trying to pull in outside information, if you keep trying to um, think for the author, you're going to run into trouble. So take what the author says as the truth of what the author believes, thinks, knows to be true. And that can help with, with out of scope. Um, I know we don't, we haven't been talking a lot about, you know, smaller details. And I know that we've been talking for a little bit, but it's just something to keep in mind, right? We've, we've mentioned the very, um, the very important constant pressure idea, with respect to practice, as well as review. Um, We've also talked about uh, just making sure that, like Jack said, you got to keep your emotions and anxiety out of it because it's something that you know how to do. It's conversations. Um, There's, there are a lot of nuances to the car section, but it's something that's within your reach. Uh, So just something that to, to think about and kind of keep in mind. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. I mean, I love the baking example too, but you know, like at the end of the day, the authors will say whatever they want to say, and it's not our goal to figure out why they said it, right? We just have to read it. We don't have to fill in the blanks. It's hard for a a pre-med science oriented student to understand that all the time, because uh, we're always trying to fill in the dots, you know, fill in the holes and, and try to figure out, okay, what's going on? Why, why is this happening? You just have to read it and understand what, what's going on in, in front of you. So, yeah, I, mean, I think those are great points. Um, quality over quantity, you know, study it, study why. Like I, I get a lot of students that ask, can I do five passages a day? Sure. If you can thoroughly review five, but it's not necessary, right? Uh, for cars, it's more about quality. For the sciences, I do think it's more about quantity. Like you just have to really hone in on all the concepts and make sure you know them well. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think just end up being a baker, right? A good baker. And don't <laughs> yeah. be stuck you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I know we talked a lot about how to review exams and uh, I think it was podcast number one, two, three, four, five, six, podcast number six, talked about how to review full length exams. And so like, if you have more, more, you, you want to kind of like dive into that, but that's such a crucial part of, of, you know, just improving. And I, I think it's really important to just, maybe the reason I hammer this so much is because it's what caused me problems at the beginning. Now cars is probably my strongest section, but at the, at the time, it, like I really struggled that back, oh God, it was like 12 years <laughs> ago. Um, but like just understanding that this is the one section where they're not trying to see what you know. That's what the other three sections, they're trying to see, can you learn like an immense amount of information and can you like, can you apply that information to these scenarios? Like the car section is no. How do these people feel? Like that's, that's the, the end task is like, it doesn't matter what's true. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how much, you know, I I would go into that section and I'd try to show like, listen, I know things I'm smart. B is a true answer. I'm good. Let me be a doctor. Right. But like, no, that's not what they're trying to do. They're not trying to test me. They're seeing, do you understand these people? And that's, that's like at the core of just what cars is like, do you understand these people? And I think if you just keep reminding yourself that like, that's really the key for cars. 
Um, now you have to like understand and like read thoroughly and like, don't like go back and re reread and re reread the same like bit over and over again. You need to like be able to look at the answer choices and not just know why the right answer is right, but why are the wrong answers wrong? But all of that, like at its basis is just like, do you understand these people? And so I think that that's a really crucial thing to keep in mind. It, it kind of reminds me of the matrix. Um, I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know where this analogy is going, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, if you've ever watched The Matrix, yeah, you see Neo look at a computer screen and it's all like these green digits, you know? And he's like, wait, what are, what are these digits? I, uh, you know, I can't see anything. And, and one of the characters goes, well, that's this and that's that. And like, they can actually decipher and see what, what it actually is. And I feel like a lot of students are in Neo's position. They, they look at the passage and it seems like it's a completely different language. And to them, it's like, I'll never get there. I can never understand this. And I, I mean, our students are a testament that you can understand it. Our students are a testament that you can actually overcome your problems, whether you do it on your own, whether you use us as a resource, you can figure it out and daily practice and just being mature and not stubborn, I think is the key. For sure. Very, very big thanks to you, Jack, our special guest, our first guest. It was great getting to hear your input um, and your perspective, which is, is the basis of all of this, right? Um, so I'm sure that our listeners are also really excited to hear your thoughts. Uh, and then as always, you guys know what to do. Go ahead, subscribe, um, leave us some comments below, interact with this video, let us know, um, let us know just what you got out of, out of this podcast and just go forth, do your best. You've got this and we're here for you.